doing stop motion. Oh, cool. Sorry, I forgot uh, to hit record. Even if we're sorry. doing stop motion um, and the light is in the space, it's a real light, um, you're still synthesizing it in some way through your set. Um, and I kind of wanted to take a look at Jane Aaron's traveling light um, as like something that's a really interesting use of light in animation. Um, where she's taken little scraps of paper and applied them to her living space and created these like paths of light from a window moving through. Um, and if you were to watch this like completely blurry, it would look like real window light. And then when you see that it's just like little piece of paper, it's like so shocking that this is what's glowing in the space. Um, and uh, also wanted to put forward Al Jarno's Celestial Navigations which is a kind of stop motion, um, like eclectic piece uh, that has a lot of use of light where he's kind of observing the window light coming through, painting it onto the wall, thinking about like the world spinning and where the sun is and thinking of light in a really um, kind of greater sense, uh, this like celestial power. And so these two, I kind of wanted to um, drop <laughs> first. So we like think about light in this way how light could be like dreamy and um, alive and really like build a space. And um, Traveling Light is on YouTube, Celestial Navigations. You have to find it uh, as a bootleg copy somewhere or at a library. I'll try to kind of note which things are available um, to watch for free. Uh, Another piece I've been thinking about is um, bird in the window. Sometimes I see it as bird in a window. <laughs> so I put both titles in. Um, but in this piece, um, I like the light treatment because we have this scene. I don't know how glitchy this is going to be on Zoom, but. Ah, okay. So we have this guy in a car and he's driving along and we kind of flicker through three different hues of light, which gives us this sense of driving. I really like this. This is such a like cool, like practical effect that he's just colored the cell in three different colors. And then we kind of get this flickering feeling of being in a car. Um, like personally, that's really evocative. Like being in a car with like flashing light makes me feel like really nauseous. Um, and just like that feeling of like bright day outside, dark car. Like it's so cool to see that captured in animation. And then in one frame, we get to see this brick wall, which tells us we're going into a tunnel. And then we see only these like three highlights of light. Um, his leg, what was that? His arm and a little bit of like the brim of his hat. And then we're in the tunnel for a few seconds and then we come out and the light is totally blown out. Um, and he's done this by just like painting one cell of white in the silhouette of the car interior and the guy, and you can still see the window outside. Like, I just find that to be like, um, really like fascinating, simple way of like giving us this like sequence of light. Um, how did he do it? <laughs> Lying on the floor or chilling in the break room, something like that. I like these behind the scenes images the slowest slideshow. Wait, my computer's like exploding right now. Sorry for the slowness. <laughs> okay, so another thing that I wanted to look at is um, like a really practical puzzle of like lighting one scene. So, um, the other night I was awake at night and thinking about what I was going to write for this presentation and I like was awake for probably like three hours because uh, I have a kitten and she's like really like active at night um, like she stays up all night just like rattling things and like biting things and running around so I like have started sleeping with my blinds open because she plays with the blinds. She like gets her whole arms and like <laughs> rattles them. And so I have to like open all the windows up when I sleep, I have two windows. And so my room's super bright at night. Um, and I get these really interesting um, like light effects. <laughs> the slideshow is like in one frame per minute. Um, so here's like, this is like literally a picture I took when I couldn't sleep. Um, 
I got these like really nice like window shapes um, coming in from behind me where my bed is. And then from the other side of the door, uh, my house has these like uh, the like TikTok lights <laughs> that go around the room uh, with like different colors. So you can see the blue coming in from one side and then the like light coming in from the window is because my apartment building has like a hallway light. Um, and so I was thinking about how rooms at night are like anything but like totally dark and how like we could compose these spaces. And so here's kind of a like Photoshop, like values change of that, um, how like that shifts the mood so much. Um, so I'm really thinking about these kind of like light paintings, like we saw kind of in the first two references uh, with traveling light and uh, celestial navigation, these kind of like shapes that are laid in and this kind of overlay feeling of like light overlapping um, like drawn space um, is gonna like come back later with kind of effects animation, but um, I kind of want to think of like an observational puzzle, like um, how to set a tone in a room. So if we're lighting a space um, in our like animated room uh, and we want to like create certain moods, um, I was kind of thinking like if I wanted to draw guilt, I would do something like stained glass, like church is <laughs> kind of like holy, like um, right and wrong feeling light. and. Uh, in this image, this is one of my drawings. I have stained glass light, window light, um, a character that can't sleep. So they're like sleeping during the day. So I put in daylight and then I put in a disco lamp or like well, a disco ball on top to give like party mood too. So this has like three different light sources um, for not being able to sleep. And for noise, like say your character is like, or whatever's going on in your scene, like can't sleep, like adding in clutter, Anxiety um, would be like screen glow or harsh window light. Um, I have an example for that one. Hyper disco ball for party mode. Um, or like if you're scared, you'd have like a lot of night lights. Like I really like kind of like building these kind of reality puzzle kind of things where it's like, what would you put in that room for like what's going on? And you could do this all with light and color, I feel. So um, here's Lane's bedroom. <laughs> I love this room. I'm just like obsessed with this um, like technique of like screen glow in rooms. Um, and she's kind of like um, got two light sources, three, I guess, if you want to count all the little like boop, boop, boops on the technology screen light and then like street light, which has silhouetted like these like images of like innocence, the bears, like such a cool like composition for like can't sleep. Um, another image, and also like what's interesting with like animated rooms at night is like the blue, blue washing, <laughs> always using blue for nighttime. Um, this one is in The Black Dog by Alison DeVere. Um, she's kind of visited, this like girl is visited by a dog from hell, and the hell dog is like <laughs> in this really like cute like observational pose. We have moonlight coming in. I think this is like a really good like can't sleep room and like dog perfectly out of her eyesight. Um, and then we have the expert on rooms where people can't sleep. Boom, does the like anxious screen glow nighttime room so perfectly. I love this one, like taking a really like a high angle. This like evokes so much anxiety with like the moon just like bearing down screen glow and like clutter, like adding, like lighting the clutter is like really good. And shadow. Come on computer. And then um, another like cool way to build light into space is to like have an architecturally interesting space. Like a classic example is like Hey Arnold, um, Arnold's room um, with these like awesome skylights. Uh, I can't remember why I put this in here. This is a cool graphic. <laughs> this is toning down the light. I, I would say like, don't be afraid to just like turn off the lights all the way. Like it's so cool. Like I feel like having an image like obfuscated by like darkness is like so sick. 
okay another like um this is like a random jump but like one of my favorite seeing logic things is um like if you want to do a road um like what a road looks like so i used to live in the pacific northwest for many many years and the roads there look black because they're always wet and like um there's no sun so there's nothing to like bleach the asphalt and then they're just like constantly like drenched in water so i remember when i was living in washington in like 2015 when uh grand theft auto 5 came out <laughs> um and seeing like uh the way the like pavement was like bleached uh by the sun uh, and i'm from california like so it gave me this like instant like feeling of like nostalgia of like oh whoa yeah roads like the roads that look like that and like such a sense of like place that um i think we could do this with like light a lot like instead of drawing like the light source drawing the effect of it so like drawing the like bleached pavement of your scene um instead of the like bright sky or like drawing the wet road Well, that's kind of a weird example that feels like very like big brain <laughs> like, whoa, road road design um i don't know why my computer's being so bad at even just like doing a slideshow today let me know if you want to share the the, po the presentation and I can screen share oh, too. That could be a good solution. It's definitely the Zoom though. Is it like on the slide of the road still for everyone? No, it's moving now. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're on like white page with pink text. Okay, cool. Um, so, a kind of cool exercise I've been thinking about is um, when I was learning sound, I learned to like um, sit in a space and like visually map out sound, like an environment. Like if there's a bird chirping, like scribbling down, like um, where the bird is without like drawing a bird, but just like drawing what that sound sounds like um, and building like a visual sound score. It's like classic, like film school exercise. <laughs> um, and you use like different colored markers and stuff. Um, and I think we could kind of do that with light. So like um, putting yourself in an environment that you kind of want to study for an animation and then um, using like a pen to just like without drawing that setting mark like where the highlights are, maybe with an outline and then with shadows like filling it in. And then like having that is just like a blueprint of what a lighting design could be. And then you could also do that in like an extreme way of like marking the brightest spots to the darkest spots and then have like maybe like a cross hatch for the in-between um, without drawing the actual space. Cause I think that'd be like really useful for like when you go in to add light to a scene. Um, I've been really interested in um, cell shading recently which is using um, color basically to do shadows. So um, if we look at these production cells from Sailor Moon, um, we see that all the shadows are actually just like different pigments. Like this is pretty basic, but like, um, I feel like when we watch cartoons, we don't really like um, think about the production that goes into that, that the shadows are actually like animated built into the image. Um, I think that's like, really cool. I have no idea how they do that. Um, I mean, it's right here that they like have the paper version um, and it's animated in there and then colored on top of that. But it's just like so impressive that you could animate that way. Um, so I kind of want to like look at these traditional techniques and then um, like think of how they're adapted to like digital processes now because we totally still like do this. Um, but um yeah and you can see it here like i just like looking at the production cells and like looking at how this was done so you could totally like do i call this like built-in shading now where you're like animating your whole like image with the like shadows like painted in so like if you get really close up you can see like every little like the different color of ink outlines and everything that's just like so fascinating um and then the other way that shadows were done in cell animation was like on a whole different layer. Um, and then like 
if this is if we were looking at two cells right here where SpongeBob is on one cell and then the shadow is on another, when you go to shoot this, SpongeBob would be at 100% opacity and the shadow would be at like 80. Um, and we still kind of do this if you use like After Effects or Photoshop in your animations. Um, it's just kind of a cool way to see it like done practically, like the like physical version of it. Um, and then the same way the shadow is done, light could be done. Um, but this is kind of like some examples in my work where I've done like shadow things. So like um, this guy like rolls, it's just like a like um, long way roll. And then the shadow underneath is animated on the same drawing as that. And then that's separate from the background. So the like shadow is built in, uh, but it's like drawn over the environment layer, which is kind of an interesting way to work. And then I pulled this drawing on the left out because like, I think it's, interesting to like take the shadow and make it into like a different shape too like that could be generative like this shadow is kind of like a little monster fuzzy monster guy um i'm frozen again <laughs> The computer likes it when the image is smaller. <laughs> so, um, another cell technique I've been like really into is backlighting. Um, and this is like a very literal lighting process where in cell, like, um, I mean, we see this in anime mostly, but um, all the like glowy effects are done by like either not painting that part of a cell um, or by scratching it out, cutting it out or like cutting holes and then shining light from the bottom. Um, I drew up this diagram that kind of shows that. Um, so this is like kind of unrelated image, but just people putting cells on the animation stand so you can visualize that. Um, we have the light shooting from below and then background art uh, with holes or scrapes or cuts um, or opaque sections and the light is passing through that um, and the characters have the same, like maybe imagine like holes in the eyes where the light shines through and it leaves like a glowy effect. Um, and then on top of that, light effects could be added back in like say fog or waves um, with like an airbrush. Um, and then same as the shadow with the opacity adjusted. Or um, if you're kind of used to how like film works, uh, multiple exposures, so, um, it's like, uh, say it's a really bright cloud. You have two of them stacked up like multiplied times each other. So they're extra bright. Um, so I think that's like a really cool way that like when you're watching old animation, you're seeing like the actual light of the lamp like underneath, like, um, and we can totally emulate this process like um, in Photoshop or After Effects. Uh, and I think like the programs are actually like built around those processes, like inspired by that. Um, and a really cool example of this is looking at the production cells from Tron, where the actual cell drawings are kind of almost just like blocked out references for where the light goes. So it's like drawn in black ink, and then they reverse this into negative and then used it as special effects overlays over live action footage. Um, and that's just like, this is so wild. I can't believe they did that. So it looks like this. And that's like the ink animation is the blue. Um, that's so cool. But like, I was so excited to see these images because this is like exactly how like me and a bunch of other people work in doing like effects animation. Um, and I didn't really realize that like Cell could do this. Um, and that that's just like how we figured out how to do that in digital ways. Um, and then when I talk about like kind of the airbrush glowy technique, um, here's an example. This is just a photograph of a cell um, from Beauty and the Beast, I think. Um, so there's no light or lamp actually behind this. This is just like painted on, um, which is kind of cool. Um, oh, and I just wanted to like give a shout out to mirrors. I feel like that's like my favorite effect in animation is like reflection because it's like such a like practical um, effect that you have to like draw in. Um, yeah, 
been thinking about the Rugrats intro a lot. And then another mirror, the asparagus mirror. Um, I grabbed some more mirrors, but I was like, I need to cut down on mirrors in this. <laughs> uh, and then we're slipping right into like straight up technical process. So um, I also really love like uh, lightless environments. So not having any lighting at all. So if I'm gonna do flat color in a scene, uh, I usually do texture. I just really don't like the look of things for me. Like I'll totally like appreciate it in other people's work. But for my work, I don't like shiny, like um, flat color fills. So I do like everything with textures um, and I build all my own textures and it's in kind of a similar like process to let's say like audio sampling or something. Um, I just sample back from my own drawings. So um, I just had this uh, cell open in Photoshop. So I use this one as my example. Uh, but I make a square in Photoshop um, by using the kind of select tool. And then I set it to fixed ratio. So it's just like a perfect square and select something that's like a repeatable pattern. So I just chose this kind of hair section here. Um, but in my like use of it, I often um, will just sample my own paper texture, like a scanned version of it. Um, and then bring that open um, into like its own window and like change that into new textures. But in this case, um, you go to, this is just like some Photoshop stuff. Like it's pretty easy to like find a tutorial on this too. If this doesn't make a lot of sense breezing through it, but like once you have your little selection chosen, um, you go to edit, define pattern, and then you get to name your own pattern. And then it's added to your pattern library. And you can see my little texture library here has a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then I'm taking that texture back around and putting it back into where I sampled it. <laughs> so like rewiring it kind of. Um, and so I've like sampled the hair once and then I put it on multiply, which is just kind of Photoshop's way of saying that you're like layering that, like adding it to it. You can imagine it's image times itself. So I put the texture back into the hair and you can see the hair section on the forehead is slightly darker than the other parts because I like put that back in. And then I done, did it one more time um, right over the top of it. So you can kind of see how that like texture, you could see it repeating a little bit. Um, but it's kind of funny because I did it, did the like sample without an actual texture, just like smooth. Um, and then here's like an example of like textures I've made. Um, and if you've seen my work at all, like you'll probably see a lot of like familiar textures because I use these like a lot. <laughs> and so these I just use as my like fills to color line work. Um, and a lot of these are just remixes of themselves. So I'll like put them into their whole document and adjust the colors and then resave them. Um, and so if you use that little technique of like sampling, editing, and then like using that as your fills for textures, you could build kind of your own texture library like this. And I find this way more interesting than using something like those downloadable texture packs. Um, those are great for like um, starting out, but it looks so much cooler to like build your own. And then the like, wild part, the twist on this is that I also use all these um, as my like lighting filters and overlays and color correction. So it's really cool to just have the textures to turn to. Um, I'll kind of like go into what I mean by that. Um, oh yeah, and then added just like a couple coloring things. Um, but once you have your textures made, um, just the like key things to know are tolerance and the contiguous button. <laughs> and so, Tolerance, if it's set to um, 10, you'll get these kind of like uh, detritus bits from the line. And this is me just coloring a scanned image. That's why there's so much noise. Um, but I um, I usually like paint bucket tool at 90 tolerance. So it just like fills all the way up to the line. Um, and you don't really know need to know like what these things mean more just what they do, <laughs> I feel. Um, and then the contiguous button, I don't know what happened to my contiguous button example, <laughs> but if you like uncheck that and you go to fill in like one of these squares, it will just paint everything, which is sometimes useful, um, but you don't always want that. And then um, 
here's like a giant like coloring thing is like um i'm sure this is like a lot of you probably already know this but if you don't know this um and it's in a lot of programs it will be in like premiere and after effects as well um but this kind of menu is huge for effects animation um and so like i filled in these little like mattress bubbles with different effects so this is all the same texture fill that i'm putting in um i've just kind of uh checked different boxes so like these first two are just multiply there's like a darken lighten screen difference divide like all these are really useful in like coloring because like you see i'm just using one swatch here and getting so many different things and then you can layer these on to themselves um so like here i this is what i'm talking about with creating like filters with the textures so i filled in one whole layer over my drawing with just the texture and then I have another menu here for effects. And then I put just like an easy like divide filter onto it. And I get this cool green room and it's affecting like all my colors individually. So those are kind of like the basic operations of like my coloring process, um, which I think like references back to like a lot of the like cell effects things and the coloring there. Like this feels to me a lot like when I paint cell, like coloring in behind the lines and stuff. Uh, oh, there's my contiguous slide. So if you have contiguous unchecked, you get the like everything gets filled at once, which that's useful too. But that can be like really like startling and confusing if you don't know that button. Um, <laughs> that's a happy face. Um, so we'll just use the same scene, this just like scan drawing to kind of look at like adding some light in. Um, and this is kind of my interpretation of how like I use this scene. So this is like a like scanned drawing. And then um, I've like in my like vision of how it looked when it was done, this window would have this light leak with really sharp light coming in. Um, and then the pool would be kind of glowing on its own. So it looks kind of like this suspended jello memory hole kind of thing. <laughs> and then um, these little like circle lights um i don't know those are just like little light refractions from like a crystal or something but say we wanted to just like um start coloring the scene um what i would generally do is like take down the brightness like a bunch like if i'm working on a room that's dark and i'm going to be like making light spots just bring down the brightness a ton so um in this scene, I added like a half opacity, like a layer of just pattern and then like a brightness filter and also multiplied the drawing into itself. So I just like threw on a bunch of quick things to just make it dark. Like I didn't really care how it looked. Um, and then I added a layer on top of that of just these like, um, I drew these with my like cursor, but just some shapes. <laughs> um, and these are just like on a blank layer um and then i added one of those quick effects buttons uh i think this is overlay i just overlaid the shapes and then uh i copied them a bunch with different effects so we have like effects on effects to get this like nice lavender glow um and you can see it's altering the lines a little bit too the lines are kind of purple which is nice uh, and then i just like cut down on the sharpness of them so it's like really glowy um so that's kind of like really quick like photoshop toolkit of like super basics of just like if you just want to like light a scene in a really easy way those are kind of some like tools and that translates to a lot of other programs too like um that's gonna be like that kind of general workflow of like altering layers like that should happen in a lot of different like settings um if you don't work in photoshop um, but I just feel like Photoshop's like a good home base um, for practical things. I also don't know After Effects. So, <laughs> um, I, yeah. So as my last step to this, I would like edit it in Premiere with like one last color correction onto it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like a process that I feel like, especially adding um, those shapes in and then um, putting the effect on that. That's like a direct like workflow copy of the cell animation of like just it's done in the computer instead of like under the camera. So I think that's kind of cool that it like echoes that. 
Um, and that's something I'm really excited about. It's just like, if this copies um, like cell processes, then what else can I like look back at um, in like how they like shot cell to like figure out new like um, digital masks and stuff. So that's really exciting to me. Uh, I wish there was a way to like literally hold a flashlight like behind Photoshop layers and like have light be coming through. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so this same process that I used for these like light highlights, that'd be the same for like creating shadows. Um, I do that a lot. Um, but I think like there's something cool about doing flat color um, with the texture, like that's really neat on its own. But like adding the color layers can like take something to a whole different like mood level, like we were thinking about with like how to draw the bedroom earlier when you can't sleep. So like, I feel like light is a neat dimension. It's something that I'm definitely adding to my work more. Like I didn't used to use that much at all. Um, but I think like even this like silly little like um, shape light thing I put on um, in like five minutes makes the drawing like interesting in a way that it wasn't before. Um, so I think we can like get really interesting with like an unexpected with lighting by creating like anomalies. I really like the feeling of walking under a bright sun in like the shadow of a tree. And the light is kind of these like um, patterned, like fuzzy spots. <laughs> like, I think that's really beautiful. I always want to like emulate that in drawings. Um, but then we also have like eclipse lighting. Like if anyone's ever been in an eclipse and you get like all these like moons like multiplied over everything, like that would be really neat to put into a scene. So I think it would be cool to like practice a lot of like observation in like lighting environments. Um, like if you were to add like eclipse lighting to a scene, that would be like so like well surprising. Um, another like lighting environment that's really interesting is if you've been like on the West Coast in the last like 50 years. <laughs> um, you know that when it's smoky, your shadow disappears um, and everything gets really like dimensionless um, and flat and dark. Um, and it's really weird to be out at noon and you don't have a shadow um, just because everything is such like soft light. Um, I think that like the smoke light is a really like interesting um, lighting setting. So just like finding these like weird environments and stuff that are like totally like quotidian, but like seem very like otherworldly. Um, hmm. that's kind of the end of the slideshow. But <laughs> but oh, yeah, sorry. that's kind of, I think that's everything I wanted to touch on with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was so incredible. If you, if anyone has questions, like please pop them in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm like, I'm still thinking about that drawing you showed us about um, in the bedroom and like so interested to hear about your process. Like it's almost like you're kind of creating your own puzzle to solve um, in a way when you were talking about like guilt or like the emotions that like kind of encapsulate the room um, and how like light is used to communicate that. Um, I'm just interested to hear you maybe speak more about that and like what emotions you bring into each room. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> like translating um, kind of feelings into images, kind of energy. I guess like a lot of my work lately has been like so, like character based and supposed to be like very interpersonal. So the lighting settings are very um, experiential to like what the characters are like living in or what their like feelings are. Um, but I have been doing a lot of stuff that's just like totally backgroundless, lightingless, and like flat. <laughs> um, so I don't, I guess that kind of like um, is interesting to me as an environment because it feels like duck amok or something. Like a character has walked off a page and they don't exist in the world. They're just in this weird like um, dreamy paper space um, with no environment and no light. And it's very like sterile um, where it's like pure character experience. Um, but yeah, as far as like the like process for like thinking about lighting and moods, it is like for me, it is just like a lot of observation. Um, I feel like walking around in the world, I see a lot of um, things that like already look like they could be animations to me. And I'm just like, oh, I need to like, how can I recreate that? I'm like thinking like of the layers in my head of like, what would I do to like create that texture? Um, like, 
and that color environment like <laughs> shocking like color things like if you see like a like perfectly like lavender bike rack in like a like weird industrial area and you're like struck by that like I love those moments that's awesome um uh, Jeremy asks what would you do to make a black character in a dark environment so I guess like how do you play with like contrast when you have darker scenes um I mean like I think what I like arrived at for drawing like environments that are like low light is that it's anything but like um totally low light that there's a ton of like light and dark spaces so I think you would just be like playing with that um and like um yeah like if the scene like is like very low contrast then like that's cool to explore with on its own like I think that that would be like really beautiful Sydney asks, do you do all your animation in Photoshop? Uh, I do all my animation on paper. I edit it all in Photoshop. Amazing. Um, another question, what is your mindset whenever doing experimental animation? Do you focus more on the how or how do you deviate from what could be more commercial animation? I don't know, if, maybe um, I punctuated that poorly. <laughs> um, <laughs> wait, so I okay, hear, let me try that again. Let me rephrase that. Um, what is your mindset whenever you're uh, doing experimental animation? Is it because you focus more on the how you create the animation or like how do you view your work as a deviation from something that's more commercial? That's a tough one because I feel like everyone that's an experimental animator is kind of like um, unsure really what, encompasses what like the full like range of experimental animation is but like I'm not trained as a traditional animator I don't really know like the real techniques I mean I know them like I can tell you like ball bounce and whatever <laughs> um like I can say those things but like that's not like how I don't know how to like work in that way but like I think that it's like kind of a like um that's such a tough one. It's a like a uh, whole like uh, network of things. It's like where you show your work, like um, the like final place where it ends up, and it's who you're working with, who you position your work around, um, what it looks like, uh, what the output is. Like I make a lot of like gifs and like really short things. That's not really what we see in as much like entertainment and commercial animation. Um, I love like entertainment and commercial animation. I think it's really cool, but I think it's also like really important to put like definitions around like what it isn't isn't. <laughs> it sounds so vague. There's no way to like not be like dreamy and wishy-washy about it. Um, another question. Uh, do you tend to work so much on experimental animation that you prefer watching content outside of what you make? Um, for example, say you prefer watching live action over anything animated. Yeah, <laughs> I don't watch a lot of animation. <laughs> um, I love film and like uh, cinematography stuff and like uh, documentary. I'm like really into documentary. Um, but yeah, I, I've been like watching a lot of like anime lately <laughs> because I mean, it's like a really good place to see like cell effects. But that's probably like the most animation I've been watching in a while. Um, I love like indulgent like youtube music video animation like if you like open an incognito window and like get just like a basic youtube like explore page and it has like all the animation suggestions on it of like the most popular most watched animation ever like i love those because they're just like so like from the heart and like um such from such like a pure place um and it's people just like making at home and like mostly like kids and stuff it's like such good animation um but yeah I've watched like a lot of like historic animation and stuff but it's not like I'll like sit down in the evenings like ah, time to unwind and <laughs> toss on some animation <laughs> um another question what is your workflow in making sure the colors you are using are accurately portrayed on the screen and also on your audience's screen that's a really good one um you can't have control over all of that um and that's kind of a fun element uh, I work on a Cintiq a lot, which like throws off the color so much. Um, it makes everything look um, 
like to me it looks really good on a Cintiq and then I put it back on the screen and it looks like really bad um, or like the opposite will happen. Um, so I work like on a mirrored screen. So I have the Cintiq like match my computer screen so I can just look, look at both references. Um, and then everything I make after I color it, I color correct it again. So like as it lands on the page from the paint bucket tool, like that won't be the final thing. Like it needs like one more color correct on top of that. And then I'll usually like airdrop something to my phone and look at it on like a second screen just to check. Um, but yeah, everyone's like screens will look different. And so everything will end up in like some weird like color environment that like you can't control. And like, sometimes it's kind of interesting that like it's um, totally like subjective. Amazing. Uh, one question I missed was, can you talk a little bit about your art work life balance and what that looks like right now? Um, yeah, or like what you're working on if you're able to. Yeah, uh, I, just finished a project like a month long project so I'm in like the nice like couple of days after that of like chilling and relaxing and like getting my life put back together <laughs> from being in like production mode um I just made a 30 second long film <laughs> on commission which is cool um that's like good probably good length I think it's coming out this week um but I made like a buddy film it's like an apocalypse like best friends um moments montage kind of thing <laughs> friend role um and i like took it as an opportunity to do like some like really intense coloring so like it's all like hand drawn um and like some loops and stuff but like uh the coloring is like way more intricately than i usually do and then on top of that i was like reading a lot about like camera angles and like the meaning behind them and trying to animate like really interesting like camera moves like usually my stuff's really like static like camera like stay still and figures in the middle um like really basic compositions and I was like I really need to like learn some new tricks <laughs> so that's what I was trying to do in this new film that's coming out um and that was like on commission which was nice it's always like cool to do that um and then um regular day-to-day -day work life balance I'm a full-time freelancer so um it kind of looks different week to week but uh I do a lot of emailing and like invoice writing and like personal admin kind of stuff um filling out forms and um like seeking things like looking around for like opportunities and like patching that together I have a very like um quilt like career of like I'll wear a lot of hats like I do illustration work I do animation work like all these different things I sell stickers <laughs> like so I just kind of do a lot of like different things every day um and as far as like balancing that with life um I mean it's been a pandemic so there hasn't really been um much life to balance with because like what else would I really be doing um but I try to go out and like I walk a lot and uh I'm raising a kitten right now, so <laughs> that's very enriching. Uh, I try to spend a lot of time with my friends and stuff and like take time in the real world and not just be in the animated world. Um, and then I guess one last note on like work-life balance is I recently like went back to having a studio instead of working on my bedroom and that's been very healthy. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, a couple more questions, I think, um, if you have the time. Yeah, that's all good. Um, Someone asked, what draws you to using paper to animate? And then I guess that also ties into the question of your interest in uh, cell animation. Um, it feels really good to animate on paper. It's like really like a uh, practical feeling. Uh, when I animate, like sometimes I animate on the Cintiq. Um, I have a few pieces that I've done that way. Um, it feels so different because you can undo and like have too much control over it um, and like there's so much like zooming in and working too close up like when you're on paper you see the whole thing all the time um, there's no like moving in and out of it um, which can like give you almost like too much control over the image um, like my factors are the size of the pen I'm using and I use like two different pens ever um, and like the kind of ink I'm using and the paper I'm using like that's really nice to just have that consistency um, and those factors like wildly change it which is weird like I've been using like uh, a paper that feels wrong for a while um and, and they like recently found a little bit of like the old paper I used to use and was like wow <laughs> that's nice um but yeah I've just always worked on paper and like it doesn't feel like 
that much of a like um, workaround for me. Like I think a lot of people think work on paper makes it like a lot harder or something. Um, it almost feels like easier. It just like adds the extra step of like scanning and editing. Um, doesn't feel like, yeah, too difficult. And um, all the drawings I keep forever. So I also don't feel wasteful because it's not like I'm just like creating the animations and throwing them in the dumpster. Like they're just piling up around me and I give them to friends and stuff. Um, and then the other part of that question was about your interest and in, like what drove you to animating with Cell. Oh, I don't actually do a lot with Cell at the moment, but I just like reading about it and looking at it. Cell's really beautiful. It's like a very like um, artful way of animating. Um, and I like that it was the way for so long that like <laughs> that was just like how they had to make cartoons. It seems so impractical to like do the things like painting out the shadows. Like that seems like so weird and laborious to me. Um, but the fact that there used to just be like, um, oh, this cat. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, just like whole factories of people just like painting cell and stuff um, is really interesting. And I mean, it has a wild labor history that's like really problematic and stuff and complex um, that I won't get into because I will just like never stop talking about that. But um, yeah, so it looks cool and it's dreamy and like it's such a like weird thing that people figured out how to do. Amazing. Okay. And then I think this will be the last question. Um, people are really want to know what supplies you use from the type of scanner to the paper to the pen <laughs> um, um yeah okay i post a lot about this um if anyone has found my like tutorials i like outline all of this if you need like a written version of it but i use um a epson scanner just like a really basic um one from like staples and the lid is ripped off so I could tape a peg bar into it. I use a one quarter inch round peg bar, steel flat for scanning. <laughs> um, and you could get that from um, Lightfoot Animation Supply in Los Angeles, California. Um, I use a one quarter inch round hole puncher that is uh, very cheap. Um, you can use one from a thrift store. You just want adjustable heads. I use three different pens, one being uh, the Pilot High Tech C gel pen um, 0.4, very small fine liner pen. Um, and you can order these in bulk from Jet Pens in Japan for $20 for like 20 pens or something, really good deal. I use a Lamy Safari fountain pen with refillable ink from Noodlers and a Noodlers Ahab Flex Nib fountain pen. <laughs> um, Ah, with <laughs> also from Noodlers um, paper. I like the recycled printer bond from Costco, um, but currently I use Target's uh, house brand printer paper. <laughs> um, and that was that so awesome? exact. That was so well done. I didn't expect you to be able to like list like the model pens and Shopping everything. List. That was so good. So, so good. Um, someone asked about uh, your looping gifts, but I believe that's something you'll hopefully cover in another one of these in the future. But if you're interested in learning, learning more, um, Anna has like all her tutorials on her website. I'll link that below. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming and like hosting the first one. Like this was like so, so incredible. Um, yeah. And thanks so much everyone for being here. It's like really cool to just like um, uh, nerd out, so to say. <laughs> and before we go, I just wanted to say the next two Tuesday evenings at the same time, we have two more uh, talks so far booked. One with Lige Morgan about um, animating 3D to rotoscoping into 2D and bringing that together. And then, and so that's on the 12th at 8 p.m. And then on the 19th, um, the stop motion artist Chris Sullivan's gonna do a talk on sustaining long form projects in the context of his films, which he's taken, like they spent 10 years in the production with. So um, those will be on the Instagram. And then last but not least, if you do experiment with um, some of the methods that we learned today, please send it in so I can share it and broadcast it. Um, I'd love to see it.
Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This is great. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you, friends. <laughs>